Indigenous Voice. Uh, today is the 3rd of August. And first of all, I would like to thank the volunteer and Sha staff which may, that make this show is possible. It's great to have with us today Dr. Uh, Carmen Rodriguez de France, Assistant uh, Professor in uh, Indigenous Education in UVic University and uh, Victoria University. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Carmen, for the show. Thank you so much, Masin. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really an honor to be here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, mm -hmm. where I have been a visitor for almost 20 years, actually, uh, this fall. Nice. Um, and it's, um, it's an honor and a privilege to live in this territory and work here. So thank you for inviting me to your show. Thanks. And the same feeling to be, uh, it's an honor to be on this territory as well. Um, clearly, we are going today to talk about the indigenous education. It's uh, whether past, present and future. So would you please tell us a little bit about what you do in university in this regard? Yes, um, at the university I work mostly uh, with pre-service teachers, so any aspiring student who wants to be a teacher. Um, we have an, a unit within the Faculty of Education, we have a unit called Indigenous Education Unit, and we have, we contribute with courses, whether they are required courses or elective courses. Um, to different programs, mm -hmm. and we also have a graduate program on masters, um, a master's program on language revitalization, mm -hmm. which is really exciting because this year uh, we just started offering the master's program at the University of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. They called upon us and asked if we could bring the um, staff, um, the instructors, mm -hmm. to deliver the program at their university. So it's quite an honor because it's the the program the only program of that nature across mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. So that has been really um, a successful program within our unit. Mm -hmm. The work that I do specifically is um, preparing future teachers for their practice. And it's really an exciting time to be doing this kind of work because my, my background is being a classroom teacher. So I can relate to the excitement of these future teachers in terms of wanting to be in the classroom and wanting to impart their um, professional um, skills mm -hmm. and, and knowledge to the students. Um, and in their program, every aspiring teacher has to take a course on indigenous education. And for some of these teachers, um, arriving into their third year of university, they have very little or no knowledge or exposure to indigenous histories. Mm -hmm. um, and that is very important. It is sometimes um, sad, saddening and mm -hmm. it's sometimes disappointing to know how these young adults arrive at university with very little knowledge about the history of indigenous peoples here in Canada. So throughout the course, which is only 12 weeks, we mm -hmm. try to share with them a little bit about the history of indigenous people, um, the history of indigenous education, traditional ways of teaching and learning, um, treaty education, land-based education, experiential learning, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's the only course that they have in the program. If students want to take different courses, they're mm -hmm. free to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's most of the work mm -hmm. that I do. Um, I also contribute um, in the social justice program, which mm -hmm. is also another area of opportunity to share indigenous perspectives and knowledge within that particular program. Mm -hmm. So um, the work I, I do is very diverse, but most of my responsibility is within the indigenous education unit. And obviously it's also connected because it's all in the end about social justice I and mean, to, to revive to keep the, la as you know, lang language and identity are inseparable. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. So when, and when this program started in the University of Victoria? Well, <coughs> excuse me, the Indigenous Education as a unit mm -hmm. has been um, existing for a long time actually, okay, uh -huh. not as um, it is today, mm -hmm. but we have long-standing relationships with the linguistics department mm -hmm. at the University of Victoria because in the 1970s the Faculty of Education and the Department of Linguistics, mm -hmm. the Faculty of Humanities, developed and delivered language programs for the immediate communities around here. Mm -hmm. So those programs ran um, in the 70s and the early 80s and then due to uh, financial constraints from the government those mm -hmm. ended. Mm -hmm. And so in the late 1990s, uh, we revived some of those partnerships and successfully we've actually delivered um, 
indigenous language revitalization certificate programs. Mm -hmm. We also have a diploma program and we have the master's degree now. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of courses specific about indigenous education, those started in around the year 2008. And in 2009, this course that I'm talking about became a required one. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a teacher, you have to take a course on indigenous mm -hmm. education. Okay, um, Dr. Carmen, would you tell us a little bit about the indigenous ways of teaching and learning? Seem, I'm sure they have a special, they, as a unique culture, they are sure they will have also a special way in their teaching and learning. Well, it's really interesting, but because the idea to, of teaching and learning is also inseparable, you were talking about language and identity, mm -hmm. and the idea of how a person learns and how a person teaches go hand in hand. Um, and this is demonstrated through experiential learning or learning by doing. Mm -hmm. So a child was exposed at an early age or continues sometimes in some communities to be exposed at an early age um, to fish or to hunt or to accompany the, the parent um, to plant and harvest um, or to do um, paintings or mm -hmm. to carve so or to fish and so forth in in those um, activities that were for everyday life were considered the, the way in which a child would learn mm -hmm. you know um, counting or their physics you know trying to calculate the the um, speed of the water and when you throw your spear mm -hmm. so you have to it is it's not just by guessing right you have mm -hmm. to learn to read nature so literacy um, is, is reading, reading the environment, reading a person's nonverbal gestures or communication. Mm -hmm. So the idea of teaching and learning um, is very different from an Aboriginal perspective than the notion that one might have in terms of a person sitting at a desk, the teacher at the front mm -hmm. uh, telling the students what to do. Mm -hmm. It's a very different perspective. And in terms of experiential learning opportunities for our students, we have a very successful and specific summer institute that runs throughout the month of June, mm -hmm. where the students who want to participate in that um, summer program are basically immersed in culture from you know, June the 2nd or the 1st to the end of June. And we take the students to Goldstream and we have knowledge keepers from the area who talk about the life of salmon, who talk about um, teach us how to strip the cedar bark from the mm -hmm. trees, mm -hmm. um, to speak the language, who tell us about the plants. <laughs> or the students who just finished this uh, past summer institute in June um, were also had the opportunity to visit Chris Paul studio. And Chris Paul is a young indigenous artist mm -hmm. and he has a studio um, out in Sarlip. And the students went to the studio, learned from him. And so the students who participate in that institute spend most of their time outside of a typical classroom at the university. Mm -hmm. So we try to emulate a little bit um, indigenous pedagogy, indigenous approaches to teaching and learning mm -hmm. that way as mm -hmm. much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, just to continue with the language, we are here specifically on the Likwangan territory and we were talking before the show started about the term a sleeping language. Mm -hmm. Would you please explain to us when they say Likwangan is a sleeping language, what do they mean here? So languages um, are classified um, according to the number of speakers, according to many different characteristics or criteria. Mm -hmm. And Likwangan is considered a sleeping language because there's only one elder in mm -hmm. Esquimalt mm -hmm. who speaks the language. Mm -hmm. So unless that elder passes on the knowledge to mm -hmm. new speakers, then with the passing of the elder, there's the risk of losing that particular language. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, Lekwungen is considered a sleeping language because mm -hmm. there's only one fluent speaker. Um, okay. The efforts are being made to record and document the language, but mm -hmm. it's not the same to have exactly. it on tapes than mm -hmm. to actually have the speakers in the community. Mm -hmm. And have it alive in the community, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, there is a re relevance here to the uh, uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. 
Would you please tell us about that? Yes. Um, there's, as you know, the 94 calls to action from mm -hmm. the from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report, um, and those calls to action, of course. Um, are aimed towards different public servants mostly, from journalists to teachers to lawyers to nurses and so on and so forth. Um, at the university within our programs, we think it's not only very relevant and the right thing to do, but also it is very timely because you probably know that the Ministry of Education has put forward a new curriculum mm -hmm. in the province of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. So the new curriculum um, includes indigenous perspectives that teachers need to implement and deliver and encourage in their classrooms from kindergarten to grade 12. Mm -hmm. So it is very timely in terms of incorporating the calls to action that not only talks about all of us having the responsibility to learn about the history and the truths of discrimination, racism, lack of social justice, equity and equality uh, for Aboriginal people in this country, but it also encourages us to be accountable as Canadian citizens. Mm -hmm. So the Truth and Reconciliation's calls to action um, encourages teachers to, um, to, to learn about these histories mm -hmm. and also to talk to their students about these histories. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting right now because it, to me it's really exciting to be living at this time mm -hmm. because I, I participate at the University of Victoria. There's an organization called Speakers Bureau mm -hmm. and it's a community service like you have here in your show. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually get calls from schools to go and talk about residential schools. Mm -hmm. And the youngest audience has been grade three. And it's really interesting because it's an opportunity to talk to students about um, losing their language. You know, I asked the, the young learners sitting in a circle, you know, how many of you come from, you know, a different heritage? And then they start putting up their hands, talking about, you know, whether they're from Spain or their grandparents from Italy. And so we start talking about, well, what would it mean, you know, if you would not be able to see them? Or what would it be like if you were not able to speak to them? and so forth. So it's, it's just giving a little um, an, an idea to these young minds and hearts as to what it would be like if they were not able to live with their parents or to live you know, away from their family. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important with the appropriate um, delivery in terms of not being, you know, not traumatizing the students or not putting some negative feelings and also being very careful for me it's important not to victimize Aboriginal people um, that's a very fine line I find sometimes mm -hmm. speaking about injustices and lack of equality and racism that one can start from um, a deficit perspective mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. victimize mm -hmm. peoples mm -hmm. Aboriginal people African American Latin American people and so forth um, and speaking the truth so for me, those are opportunities to learn, you know, being an instructor at the university on how to walk that fine line between speaking a truth, uh, making sure that those voices are heard or those realities and histories, and at the same time not victimizing people when those truths are spoken. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to start at a very young age. Talking of the residential school, um uh, which is a deep, deep wound, I think, and a part of a, a big system. It's not the only crime happening to the indigenous people, mm -hmm. but uh, this is one of the latest crime that we are lately talking a lot about. So when you go and talk about this uh, residential school, uh, would you please give us some summary about the main, the main point you try to bring to people when they think about residential school? What are they? Well, I think important is, and, and it depends, because I've been in grade threes and I have been in grade 12 mm -hmm. classrooms. So grade twelves, of course, have a, a different sense mm -hmm. of themselves, but mm -hmm. also different sense perhaps through social studies and all subjects, other subjects at school, of what that meant or what that might have been like. Um, with, the, with the older grades, I usually talk about how the idea of residential schools was policy 
by, by the government. It was not something casual. It didn't just happen serendipitously. Mm -hmm. It was not a coincidence. It was policy uh, to first assimilate, and when that didn't work, then we segregated. And when you know, and now we're living in an era of integration. So I talk about that um, stance in terms of understanding the Indian Act and how there were amendments and how that affects the lives of Aboriginal people in different communities. Um, with great trees, I start with the idea of how, how would you feel if you, were, if you were taken? But I think an important piece is to always uh, bring the emotion to flourish. So if um, Nella Nelson, who is the school district coordinator uh, for Aboriginal education of School District 61, always says that you need to tackle the emotions. If we don't feel uh, the topic that we're listening or the novel that we're reading or the movie that we're watching, then we'll forget it more easily. Mm -hmm. So I try to bring um, some sense of, you know, what do you think this was like? Because it's not a happy chapter in history. It's a very sad and tragic chapter. And as such, we need to tackle it with respect. We need to honor those who lost their lives, and we need to understand how all of that still carries ripple effects to this date, whether it's with the missing and murder Aboriginal women and young girls, mm -hmm. whether it's to, um, with the children who were um, victims of the 60s scoop, and so forth. So it's important that they see the links that in their minds, if they're 15 or 16, 1950 is far away, right? Mm -hmm. 1960, 1970 is like decades away. Mm -hmm. um, but when I say to them, imagine my children, you know, me being taken away from my parents because I was, you know, was born in the 60s, so mm -hmm. I would be a person. So it's not that far away. And so just trying to make it real for them in terms of this is not in your, this does not belong in your history books. It belongs in the reality in which we live and in the society and in the place in which we live. Uh, in regard to Scoop 60, um, would you tell us a little bit about, about it? Because I think there's a lot of people know, don't know also about what is Scoop 60. So just very in, in, in a few minutes, um, the 60s scoop is, is a term that was used and coined in the, in the 60s, uh, but actually it lasted until the 80s. So it was, again, it was a policy um, that encouraged social workers and nurses and doctors um, and other service providers to take away the children from their families uh, with the justification that the families of these Aboriginal children were not fit to raise them. Mm -hmm. um, if one creates a, a mental timeline, one can see that in the 60s, these young parents were the children who were coming out of residential schools. And so these, pa these children didn't have any role models for parenting because they were taken at age six or seven or eight. So one parent in the way in which one was parented, right? Mm -hmm. Most, m more often than not. So these children um, who started having their own children in the 50s and the 60s, then carried all of that emotional baggage and residue from residential schools. So the abuse and the neglect and the control and what one would term as a dysfunctional family situation was created in their homes. So the government said, well, you know, look at your house, it's moldy, um, it's, you know, you have four children living in one bedroom and sharing. And so excuses were created to take the children away from those homes. Mm -hmm. um, not only that happened, but also when these children were taken away, some of them was, went to foster homes. Others were sold to the United States families uh, who would pay the government to have their children. Um, and some of them were t you know, t taken to group homes or non-Aboriginal families, most of them. And another aspect of that era is that the adopted children didn't have access to their files. Some of them never knew where they, were, where they came from because the files were destroyed 
um, until 1989, the government initially in Ontario allowed the, the children to access their files and those who were able to find who their parents were, if they had any siblings um, for the first time knew that. So we can see that there's another branch of injustice and another branch of discrimination and another branch of lack of equity and accountability uh, from the government in terms of responding to, to those children who were scooped, who were taken away from their homes during those decades. So 60 scoop, not scoop 60, sorry, I'm an Arab, it's, always it's a, with six yeah, switch things around. The 60s around. scoop. But I could say in that case that uh, 60 scoop is kind of like adding an insult to an injury. Mm -hmm. Original abuse, instead of dealing with the original abuse, there was an additional abuse added to the already people who are a victim of the, uh, the residential school. You add to them another abuse now. So. Um, just to move a little bit to a, a, a borough subject, uh, you, uh, I noticed there is a website, uh, Arrow to the Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes uh, very well with the other work you do in university, so would you please tell us about that also? Well, um, Arrow to the Moon actually is a name that um, appears in the original, well, in the summary of the TRC's report. So the TRC um, has 94 calls to action, and that's probably the one that most of us have read. Mm -hmm. But then there's a summary of 525 pages, mm -hmm. and I can say of myself that I am a report junkie. I don't do the social media thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I dedicate my time to reading reports, anything that has to do with Aboriginal child welfare, um, social justice, and in this case, I'm almost, um, more than halfway through the 525 page summary wow. report. Mm -hmm. But then there's two volumes mm -hmm. uh, of maybe a thousand pages each um, of the TRC, like the actual report. Mm -hmm. So it's up to people, you know, how, how they want to spend their time and reading. So I read the summary, um, I'm, I'm reading it, and I, I'm fascinated by things of the past, I have to say, by history of how things came to be. Mm -hmm. So I was intrigued by this play that was staged in 1967 uh, with Aboriginal people, Aboriginal people, young people, mm -hmm. and it, it was called Arrow to the Moon. Mm -hmm. So there's a mention of the people who participated in that play, and I went and Googled further and it took me a while and I went to different archival sites and I found a beautiful photograph of this, these young performers. There are actually several photographs. And I, I liked the, the metaphor of an arrow to the moon or the imagery that that evoked in me. So um, I had it always in my mind and recently, this year, because of the new curriculum, because of the calls to action, um, there's also a sense of urgency from practicing teachers, or mm -hmm. what we call in-service teachers, for professional development. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the teachers in our schools are very anxious, are very nervous about what is it that we're going to do with the new curriculum. How am I going to implement and deliver curriculum out about Aboriginal arts, about residential schools, about even you know, the, um, the proper name to use. Some mm -hmm. teachers uh, start with, is it native, indigenous, Indian, Aboriginal, First Nations? What do I use? What, mm -hmm. what is appropriate? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, anxiety and stress in, in my experience interacting with either former teachers or teachers in practice. So um, a group of colleagues um, from the university and one of the elders with whom we work, and he's a wonderful artist, Mr. Butch Dick from the Songhees Nation. Mm -hmm. He is the education liaison for the community, mm -hmm. for the nation. And we do, we've been, you know, in partnership with the Songhees for many, many years. So um, one of the schools here in Victoria called us for professional development opportunities, and they wanted an all day workshop, you know, just to talk to their staff about. Um, different ideas on how to use this new curriculum, what are some resources that they could reach out for, um, how can they get engaged with the community and so forth. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Butch Dick 
um, another colleague who's a wonderful ally. She's not Aboriginal, but she's very knowledgeable and very kind, Miss Carol Nowachowski, um, and Dr. Nick Claxton, who is a colleague at the University of Victoria. We thought, well, let's put together, you know, a one-day workshop for this school and delivered it. Mm -hmm. And they liked it and they appreciated it. So we thought, well, why don't we work together on this endeavor um, as a um, as a community service, as professional development for other schools. So in different capacities in which um, they, they ask us to participate, um, there's a lot of school administrators, I have to say, who are very supportive mm -hmm. of their staff learning about resources and having exposure to people in the community and opportunities. Mm -hmm. So we are going to deliver another workshop on September 1st. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very timely that we are doing this kind of work because mm -hmm. there are, you know, across the city, there's a lot of consulting companies um, on indigenous perspectives around law or business mm -hmm. or um, water conservation. Mm -hmm. environmental issues but there are no organizations or groups of people who do this kind of work in terms mm -hmm. of education or approaches to teaching and learning so that is what we're trying to provide uh, as you mentioned it seemed like again the curriculum is has a bit strong relationship to the uh, truth and reconciliation commission um, but uh, let, uh, we still have like a couple minutes left would you tell us a little bit about the challenges, the tensions, and uh, uh, face the educators and uh, who work uh, on this issue? Mm -hmm. Well, both in my experience, pre-service teachers and in-service teachers are very worried with being respectful. That is a concern, mm -hmm. with not making mistakes, with following protocol. But mm -hmm. if one hasn't been exposed to what that looks like, then one doesn't know where to start sometimes. Mm -hmm. So um, the challenges and the tensions relate to not knowing where to start, not knowing how they can access resources, not knowing how to reach out to community. And um, I think that can be alleviated by learning more. Um, if one dedicates some time to go to events, I notice a poster outside of your door about indigenous art you know, next, starting next week mm -hmm. uh, in the Mary Winspear Center. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, what if I go and I learn about contemporary young artists? Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities right now at the Legacy Art Gallery that belongs to UVic. Um, there's an exhibit of Aboriginal artists. The Robert Bateman Center has an exhibit about the song, His History. So there's multiple opportunities to learn. And I think that uh, one could do the best service by learning and exposing oneself, um, getting rid of the fear, you know, what if I offend, what if I make a mistake? My mother always talks about common sense and she says that uh, is the least common of all senses because we talk about it but we don't use it. <laughs> and so um, I think that exposing yourselves to possibilities is a good place to start. Dr. De Francis, uh, it's really great to have you here to talk about this very important issue, education and bringing back the language with relate as we, we both agree, bringing the identity of the indigenous people as it is without breaking it. This is a gr important work. Thanks a lot for what you're doing and thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thanks for watching this segment of Indigenous Voice. Welcome back to the Indigenous Voice, to the second segment. And uh, I again would like to thank the volunteer and Shaw staff uh, to make this show possible. Uh, in this segment, we have with us Ben Belke, who is an artist and a carver. Uh, welcome, Ben, to the show. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm Ben Pelkey. I'm Coast Salish mm -hmm. from this area. My band is um, Stay Out. That's out towards Sydney. I'm a proud, proud band member of there, and my Pelkey name I'm very proud to carry and honor the, the people that come and visit us. Part of that uh, tradition that when we have people come and visit us, we say Haichika. Thank you. Haichika. And part of that is given to you a gift of who we are. 
Mm -hmm. And I honor that you're here and I honor that you visit us. Mm -hmm. And then you get to know our people more. So this is a gift for you. Oh, Ben, what a surprise. So <laughs> what it, a surprise. It, it's oh, to thank you for coming to see us. And thank you for being, having me here to speak. And I thank you very much. Hi, Chika. Uh, hi, hi, Chika. hi Chika. This is the first yeah. time I'm saying this word. Hi, Chika. You got it I will right, never too. forget it. Yeah. And I so promise, Ben, yeah. this one is so dear and going to stay in every show on our table. Oh, and thank this you. This is an honor. Thank, thank you very you. much. And actually, not just that, uh, oh. as a refugee, to be on this territory in indigenous unceded land, oh. it's also an honor. It's, uh, yeah. and, uh, this is well, our duty here to talk about. You're a gift to our people by coming to say hello. Anyone that comes to the Vancouver Island or this area as a Coast Salish people, our people respect and honor the people that visit us. So I've always believed that with my dad and my grandparents and everyone, that we smile and enjoy life. We walk with honor. We don't try to own anything. We don't want to do that. We want to share and give the gift of who we are. And that's a smile, right? So, and part of our life too, is it, it's, um, it's the salmon. Uh, we're uh, the salmon people, circle of life. The salmon goes out and enjoys life and learns out in the sea. And then he comes back home and he shares with the people so that he can sit, tell the world of what he's honored, what he's learned. But he always carries the words of their people and respects anywhere he goes is to honor what you do and how you walk like you do when you're here. You're respecting us by giving us this show, and I thank you for that. Uh, it's actually, it's a duty. Um, uh, actually, we say in Arabic, there is no thanks for doing the duty. Yeah. And um, I, I think any, any human have a, their feet on this territory, they have a duty to learn about who the culture of the yeah. people who live on who this land are, for yeah. thousands of years yeah. before anybody come here. Well, you know, I, th I think part of that is, is, is not a, a duty, it's, it's a gift of knowing that you're part of it. It's like the animal spirits that we believe in. They've been here, they, they, we learn what they do, and we honor that we can learn that. So when we walk, we're learning because we want to, not because we have to. We give the gift of what we've learned to share with the world. And with the world, we can all smile when you can just give a good gift of a smile. And part of that is for my soapstone. I love being down there and teaching the world what I've done. Yeah, talking about teaching. Uh, yeah. But before talking, uh, well, I want to learn a lot about that. But yeah. before, why you started working with the soapstone? With soapstone? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, you know, in 1974, I graduated. And um, trying to figure out what you do, of course, when you graduate. What did you study but, at that time? Uh, yeah, what I studied, it was um, three years through school, I was learning the native art, the designs, and how to draw. Rather than doing the circles and squares, they taught, they said I could do whatever designs I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I did videotaping and, and recordings of our elders learning different styles of artwork. So I was doing that for a few years. Mm -hmm. And my, my family, we went to Seattle, and my older brother, Herb, um, met an Eskimo carver. His name was Eddie Omnick, very famous soapstone carver. Mm -hmm. So he was learning off him. And then they were teaching me only how to sand it, which makes it smooth, right? Mm -hmm. And then you spray it. But the problem with that, you don't get paid much for sanding. So I decided, nope my turn to work. So I decided that, um, and I would not disrespect the Inuit style, mm -hmm. so I don't carve that style. I carve our, our animal spirits that we have on the island. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason for that is, is that um, it represents the artwork that we do for the people. When we draw and paint our designs, we use the animal spirits that are within us. So the only ones I carve are the animal spirits, like the salmon, the bear, the wolf, the killer whale, 
you know, all the animals that we have on, that, that share the land with us. Mm -hmm. That's the honor that we have to bring out. So I can now represent our people through Soapstone for 40 years now. Mm -hmm. And it, I, the honor for me is that it's been all over the world, mm -hmm. even your area. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be able to know that my artwork has moved around. And now that I do that, I teach while I'm there at work. Mm -hmm. So they can learn that honor of being able to smile and say, thank you for taking this home. Mm -hmm. That spirit's going to be with you. Mm -hmm. That's the part why I love about Soapstone, right? And you're, you're the, through the 40 years now is what stone to work with, mm -hmm. what weren't, what sh what's good, what's bad, what's hard, what's soft, mm -hmm. right? So. And where do you bring the stone you work on? I work at the Inner Harbor, mm -hmm. and I do it right there so that, you know, I can take a piece of stone like this and create this. And this one here would take about an hour. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it that long, so. Mm -hmm. That I just love creating them. I love, I use files, mm -hmm. I use saw, mm -hmm. and then I just keep filing until it comes alive. But I meant to ask where, where the stone itself come from? This Do comes from Brazil. Brazil? Yeah. Okay. This one comes from Italy, mm -hmm. and this comes from Spain. And the reason I use those is that our BC stone, some of Washington maybe, has asbestos in it, naturally in the stone. So I, I teach people oh. I don't want to get stone that's going to hurt them in wow. the long run. Yeah. So that's mean. Um, are you saying that the stone, if an indigenous artist and you want to work on indigenous stone? stone yeah. Be not, it wouldn't be safe. Would, oh. Yeah. That's why it's to be safe, you buy the stone. And I buy it from one of the local stores here in town. and. Um, they bring it in from Vancouver. From Vancouver, I get it from them. But to preserve this kind of art, in that case, it's a very expensive process. Not really. No, I think um, I, I'm paying about $2 a pound, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's not bad. But usually artists are, um, you know, art um, not that uh, always underestimated, only few yeah. profit. Uh, Oh, I'm yeah. talking about a prophet, <laughs> yeah. somebody, a messenger, a holy yeah. messenger who yeah. carried that, the flag of working with art in right. spite of all the struggle because yeah. it's usually difficult to survive. So and now you're adding... You know, the, the, for me, the, 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 over the years, the, I, I've always felt just keep it simple, right? Mm -hmm. I, I know I get talked to a lot about um, prices on my carvings, mm -hmm. like I guess most artists, right? Mm -hmm. um, wait a minute. Why aren't you charging more for that? That's not me. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea that it's going to a good home. And that's what I teach my students mm -hmm. is that you know that spirit is going to be with them for as long as they want it because they enjoy that spirit. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's not the money. Mm -hmm. It should be, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, I just love creating them. And I don't, I, I know that some people when they're traveling, it may be their only trip. So why would I want to be like the stores? And no disrespect to the stores. They have to make their money. But I, I'll still charge what I feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Because I know how long it takes me to make one. Mm -hmm. And I know how to create them. Mm -hmm. And the gift is, is sharing it, like I say. you know. And it's actually going to be a very special gift or a, a, something to buy from yeah. somebody from Spain yeah. to come and buy a stone from Spain was done, the art on it. Right there. It's yeah. a, it's still, it's and I, I tell people, I say, you know, you, if you see this stone and you want a salmon, come back in an hour and a half, you'll have a salmon. <laughs> so it gives them that time to look around more. Mm -hmm. We have some very good artists at the Inner Harbor and mm -hmm. some of our, our younger artists, um, wow, I've seen them from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's so nice to see the creation of their artwork build mm -hmm. like mine has mm -hmm. but to know that we are all sharing what we have learned and we've taken the time to do that it's again about sharing yeah huh? yeah uh, and talking of teaching which is a different mm -hmm. process than the creation itself i'm sure well, you have a pleasure in that process again that's uh, as well. the, that's one of the good parts right because mm -hmm. you are taking somebody's mind 
and changing from what their thoughts are like from you are uh, with the animal spirits that you have in your area mm -hmm. to our spirits that we have here so mainly I just go hold this stone move it around in your hand find out what that spirit might be in there that you feel it is not me I can tell you what I can make out of it but when you're learning to find out and feel what that stone is, that's the gift. Because then you start going, oh, oh, I see, it's a bear, or it's an eagle. The other thing I teach him, I said, when you're done playing with the stone today, because it's only your first day, is that you go home, you watch videos, you look at books about the animal spirits that you're working with, so you get to know them here and here. So the honor is that your parents or whoever, if you're a younger person, is going, wow, he's interested. Or she. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Thanks gift for saying is that. knowing that they're doing that. So when they come back again, they're more excited. They want to know what's in that stone. They'll bring it back the same way. But they'll look at me and say, I know what it is. Right? I can draw on there and give them a design but that doesn't feel like they they're learning what they want to what and that's the true feeling of that animal spirit they want to make or even abstract you know whatever mm -hmm. you you feel is in that stone is what you're bringing alive mm -hmm. and that's what i like is that that's why i say pe people look at me and i go well i brought it alive i have because it's going your home Mm -hmm. And it'll be live in your heart and your mind. Mm -hmm. And every time you look at a salmon, you'll go, wow, i seen that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is, is that um, I've been going to Goldstream where our salmon run. Mm -hmm. And I go up and I try to teach the kids that are up there. But over those years, the best part for me is I can walk over a salmon and I can... Um, see how he's moving. He's not just a straight tail like that. He's got movement. So you want to bring that alive in the stone. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have that same design all the time. Everybody moves different. All our animal spirits, our people in life, all never do. We want to find out what that movement is. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So the honor is bringing that out. You know, I think the, one of the funniest was a lady came, she was from the States, and she goes, how did I bend the tail? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, mm. uh, no, we don't bend it. Industrial <laughs> machine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the fun part, too, is showing them how, mm -hmm. just right there, you know. And uh, once I do that, there, I do have people, uh, one, lady, one lady from Germany, a gentleman from Croatia. I have uh, three boys from Ontario. And um, those are the ones I've taught this year. They sat for the whole day and created their animal spirit they wanted. And that is just such a good feeling because I, they made it right there. Mm -hmm. I have all the tools. I have the stone that they want to work with. Mm -hmm. And I teach them right there. And so when they go home, they go, yay, I made that. Right. And what about the indigenous community? Is there, is, do we see now any young generation oh. more interested in that? And why, uh, they, they know why they are it's creating important? it? Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, like the, the best part for me is, is that I live in Victoria. Mm -hmm. So um, I go out to my reserve once a month to, to see them. And to see the younger spirits, the younger native artists that are out there now, it's like, wow, it's so mm -hmm. awesome because they're willing to hold on to what we share in life. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to learn from their family how to make drums, how to make, you know, beadwork and sweaters and, and stuff. There is so much in there. You know, um, a lot of our people back in my day was a lot of sports. Mm -hmm. We played soccer, baseball, in every sport we can. So there was never really sitting still to learn. But what I see now is just great. Actually, you know? I'm learning lately about the appreciation of sport, but obviously the indigenous culture, they have a huge appreciation for art. Yeah, 
Yeah, and especially on the island. Mm -hmm. it, it is really nice to know because I've been to um, San Francisco, I've been to uh, different uh, California and that. It was, San Diego was one place and I couldn't find art stores, native art stores. And I was like surprised because here mm -hmm. you walk down three or four blocks, you'll find native art, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know whether it's been lost in its time or they're just trying to gather their way of doing it. I, I will never question that. Mm -hmm. But for our people, it, it, it's just part of who we are. We want to show the people the animal spirits that we share life with. Like we did earlier, we shared each other's experience of meeting. That's the honor of, of who we are and how we share everything. We don't want to walk away and say, I own this. It's, it's just too, it's not positive for me. It's, it, it's a, the gift is sharing what you know and knowing that when you walk away, you both had a really good experience. And actually that was that is the indigenous uh, society that, before yeah. before the colonial settler the whole idea about owner uh, private ownership yeah. it's uh, yeah. it's yeah. completely strange uh, stranger idea similar to the colonial settler themselves yeah and uh, you know w with my grandchildren and my my I have a boy and a girl and I try to um, let them know that uh, no we don't own we share and what we learn from people and how we walk and teach of what we've been taught is to share that. Not walk away and say, I own that and I'm not going to share it. Where's the gift in you? When you decide to own everything, you're becoming by yourself. Whereas if I share or anyone else shares, you're given to everybody. And I'd rather walk like that than sit at home and say, I own this, I own this, I own this. No. If somebody needs something, I'll help them. And uh, with my grandchildren and my children, I hope that it stays within their heart and their spirit and gift of life, right? Because that's only, you only have one. And that mm -hmm. gift of life is the smile and caring that you have for people, especially visitors. Yes. <laughs> and now home, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah the the idea of home. It's uh, big I, smile. I like it. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually personally I believe like uh, there is a Czech writer once said his name Milan Kundera. Mm -hmm. My home where I hang my hat. Yeah. yeah. So and especially for refugees. Yeah. The idea of home. It's. Uh, it's the hardest it's, part uh, of what I it's see. It's kind of an abstract idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know now that you're here, you are. Mm -hmm. yes. And the gift is that you've, you're meeting and you're taking the time <laughs> to find out who we are as, as Native people on this island. Mm -hmm. You know, through your job, but through you yourself, mm -hmm. you've decided to say, no, I'm, enjoy I'm loving this because I'm meeting our, my people. You know, it don't matter what name we go under, mm -hmm. um, indigenous, native, you know, Indian, mm -hmm. we're still the same. But here on, on, on Vancouver Island and this area, Coast Salish area, we just enjoy that you come to see us and that we honor every day that you stay. That's the best part of, of being a good people like you. Right. Thanks, thanks. Man. Actually, last weekend we have the Yellow Wolf uh, yeah, Bow Wow drummer. event, and I attended all three days there. And Isn't that great? I think if you want to learn about indigenous culture, color, dancing, art, yeah. Bow Wow give you all that. Yeah. You will and I'm sure you, you always you will learn something new. I learned how to sing Bow Wow, mm -hmm. and that was such, because it's not our people. Mm -hmm. That's a that's more American or mainland, a powwow music, mm -hmm. but uh, we have family in in West Sandwich, which is Sartlip, and mm -hmm. um, they taught my family how to sing powwow. And what an honor! And it's such a great experience to find other things, right? Like you're doing with our people too, is learning who and what we have to share again, and that that was such a great feeling and the power. Wow, you know. And, and everything mm -hmm. that we do is just such a good learning. And 
And that power, actually, there was a clear confirmation of what exactly you are saying now about we always we have our hand open and we share yeah. everything. Yeah. Elder Tom Samson, yep. who uh, the, one of the uh, the main organizer behind yeah. the whole, uh, he uh, he suggested and actually he did the ceremony to welcome the Syrian refugee. Oh, that's uh, awesome! And it was overwhelmingly yeah. overwhelmingly sweet, and, yeah. and to be part of that. Uh, and this is last week. Did you dance? Uh, I I would stand in line in a circle and yeah, shake yeah, the all circle and dance. Yeah, yes, uh -huh. yeah. But it's great because mm -hmm. do you feel that power when you were in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you I, feel that strength of the people. It was an unusual thing to see. Kind of, again, the idea of in spite of all oppression, in mm -hmm. spite of all what happened to indigenous community yeah. here, they are still welcoming refugees. Oh yeah, and wide open arms. Well, you know, I look at it as um, years ago it happened. A lot of, of, of um, bad things happened to our people. That, to me, it still lingers within myself, too. But I feel that if I lived that, I wouldn't have a good life. I would be more either upset or sad through my time. My dad smiled, my, bet, and my dad always said, no, just be happy and know that people that you meet will be happy because you are. So don't carry the pain, don't carry the hurt. It's hard to, to it's easy to say, but hard to live. Mm -hmm. But if you meet the right people and you live the right circle, your gift and time of, of this, this world will always be okay. I yeah. usually don't question artists' belief because yeah. what they do is enough as an yeah. artist. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, again, I, but I still I believe history is very important, but yep. what you are doing actually in many ways bringing that culture alive again. Yeah, So yeah. And, and, somehow, and through the young and through the old, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's not a bad thing to come up and, especially as, as native peoples in our, in our city now, in some places, Isn't, don't be afraid to come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. We don't bite. <laughs> and we'll share what we have to give you a gift of time here, you know. And a lot of the young people have a hard time touching base with our people. But it's okay to smile and just say, hey, I think I want to learn something from mm -hmm. him, you know. Yeah, so and actually it's amazing to see these smile in spite of uh, all what happened. So Yeah, yeah. it it. it um, Tell you about the it can spirits. be really emotional, and mm -hmm. it can. There are bad days and good days, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but when I walk outside, I represent my family and my people. Mm -hmm. And when I walk down the road, I work at the Inner Harbor. I represent our people, mm -hmm. and I want them to know that I honor them. And to honor them is not be angry, upset, or sad, saying this is what happened to me. My world is over. I'd rather say say you know. I woke up today. Now I want to go to work, and I want to share what I know, mm -hmm. not what I've experienced. I've lived that. No thanks. Don't want it anymore. You know. Mm -hmm. I'd rather people know that I am a gift of time, not a length of time. And this is this is the spirit that we need in our people, and any people that have suffered or struggled. It's just to say we made it. We're still here. We're still a human. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to meet anyone mm -hmm. to say hello to. Mm -hmm. That's where a gift comes from, from everybody, right? And if you noticed, I don't know whether you noticed in the, at the powwow, um, when people, our native people meet other people, we're always laughing and joking around. Mm -hmm. There is no hi. Mm -hmm. There's always, you got to be happy. You got to be comfortable. Actually, you know. there was a section about t telling a jokes. Yeah. They were very funny jokes, actually. Yeah, yeah. I and notice the word babe repeated a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, that, you know, if you look, go down the Inner Harbor, too, some days, we're all just joking around. We sometimes forget about the tourists mm -hmm. because we want to relax and enjoy who we are, mm -hmm. right? And let the people know that visit us from all over the world that we're just comfortable. We just want to learn. We want to share, but we want to smile while we're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, so many world 
problems and, and, and disaster. Um, it's unfortunate. Um, we've been through it. But I honor that, that the children now and tomorrow will never have to deal with that. And if they see me, I'd rather see, let them know that I'm smiling. I don't want to teach them anger or hurt when I can teach them respect, love, and caring. Because that's the way it's supposed to be, right? So, And by the way, Ben, um, uh, you just gave me uh, an indication a new things to whenever I see I'm going for sure to smile. There you go. And I'm, I'm not going to forget the connection between that gift and sharing and smile. Oh, so that's thanks great. a lot for that. For oh, that no lesson. problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I was very honored to be here, right? And, you know, you got to go to Goldstream on the salmon run and you'll see him moving. So what, tell me a little bit about the salmon, the bear, and the, why it's important to to bring their spirit out. To bring their spirit in the stone. In the stone. Um, for myself, you know, there, there has been so many um, different ways of how um, our animal spirits have been represented. And through our people, it's through the longhouse, so I can't speak that much of it. But I know that um, a lot of it has to do within you and your, your, your heart and your mind. Mm -hmm. And um, the stories that, that can be told about, about our people and through the animal spirits and how they've helped us through life and how they watch over us. And how you that know? humanity, not just about the humanity, humanity it's about and the animal spirits. We are all connected. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you know, like for me, um, I was told at one point in my life that um, let's say I'm having a bad day and um, an eagle shows up. Well, he's, he's showing up to tell me I'm okay. The salmon comes when I'm not feeling good. I was down at the Inner Harbor one year, and the salmon, he's about that big. No salmon come at the Inner Harbor. And he stayed right in front of me and circled. And then when I went to see him, he swam away, but he wanted me to know I'm okay. So, you know, our spirits come to us in different ways. But through animal spirits, they, for me, they're, they're there to tell you you're going to be okay. Unfortunately, Ben, I would love to hear more about sure. But uh, we are out of time. No problem. And, but it was a great lesson to know. Yeah. And thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Haichka. Haichka. There we go. <laughs> thanks for watching this uh, segment. And Haichka.